Hey there, folks. I'm Mark from Spectrum Pulse. And yeah, Drake Album Bomb, it's here. And this, it's Billboard Breakdown. I don't remember. Look, I know y'all don't want to hear me complain again about Drake. I'd be well within my rights having to cover 13 new songs from this project a week after I actually fully reviewed it. And by all means, the discourse has kind of moved on. It's a chore more than anything else. And Drake's cultural ubiquity stopped being interesting years ago. But I will say that there were some expectations that this was going to do a little better on the Hot 100 or last a little bit longer. And with a new Bad Bunny project coming next, Next week, it's gonna be fascinating to observe the upcoming fall off. But yeah, let's start in the top 10, where Drake, of course, got the new number one, almost entirely driven on streaming, but good sales came to nudge this over the top. First person shooter with J. Cole. Now, I don't expect it's gonna last at this height, and that's tied to our number two, I Don't Give a Fuck by Drake featuring Yeet. Where the Yeet fans here are trying to do the concerted streaming push to keep this in the top 10 to be at least competitive next week. Though they didn't even win the streaming battle here. Speaking of which, Virginia Beach by Drake got the number three, predominantly on streaming. And then we got the first non-Drake entry with Paint the Town Red by Doja Cat at number four. Mostly because of consistent radio growth and how its YouTube is a lot better than you might expect. Then we got two more Drake songs, Calling for You with 21 Savage at number five, and Slime You Out by SZA returning up to number six, both thanks to a lot of streaming. And then Snooze by SZA held up to number seven, which I'll chalk up to a thin sliver of radio dominance and the reason for that once we get past daylight by drake at number eight again streaming is cruel summer by taylor swift at number nine where there's been a real concerted radio and sales push and you could tell that her fans are desperately trying to make this a thing to challenge for the number one at least before 1989 taylor's version drops this friday finally we got one more drake song with fear of heights at number 10 Y'all get the drill by this point. So let's move on to our losers and dropouts. There literally were no returns, and the only gain was Slime You Out getting into the top 10. So we're going to drill in a little bit of the songs that have been forced off. We got the tracks that clinched their year endless spots, like Karma by Taylor Swift and Ice Spice, and Calm Down by Rima and Selena Gomez, forced all the way from the top 10 into recurrence, with Where She Goes by Bad Bunny likely winding up getting there, but it's borderline. I've said that before. But then we get a swath of songs that fell very well short. Oh You Went by Young Thug and Drake, Sabor Frieza by Fuerza Regida, Tulum by Peza Pluma and Grupo Frontera, In Your Love by Tyler Childers, Spotless by Zach Bryan featuring the Lumineers, and Fiend by Travis Scott and Playboy Cardi. But now for all those losers, it's literally 64 songs. It makes rattling them off utterly pointless, especially when we got album bombs coming for the next two weeks at least. So, Let's focus on the tracks that didn't lose by that much, like Fast Car by Luke Combs clinging onto Radio Momentum at 13, or I Remember Everything by Zach Bryan and Casey Musgrave still having a lot of tangible streaming at 14. It did not get undercut by the album bomb by that much. Then we got the songs that actually held their own, and the majority are of legit quality. My Love, Mine All Mine by Mitski held at 54, pretty much to my astonishment. It appears her virality's got staying power, and off the debut, why? Water by Tyla actually picked up a bit to 63, as did Stick Season by Noah Khan. Imagine how big these could have gotten without Drake squatting over here. But not all of those holding firm are all that good, because the last two are Can't Have Mine by Dylan Scott at 90, and God Gave Me a Girl by Russell Dickerson off the debut to 96, both of which I'm chalking up to Nashville Radio Inertia, and how Drake's album bomb predominantly hit the upper half of the Hot 100 with more tangible impact. Speaking of which, we are absolutely in an album bomb scenario and the bigger one with a full 22 new songs the majority are in the top 20 and i'm going to be talking about them but outside of those and accounting for the best and worst of this week we got tried our best at 21 members only with party next door 24 although this was very close to being among the worst it's bad all the parties at 26 featuring chief keith drew a picasso at 27 another late night at 29 featuring lil yachty away from home at 32 BBL Love Interlude at 36, Polar Opposites at 37, and Screw the World Interlude at 42. Now again, this still gives us frankly way too many new arrivals, but we're actually not starting with Drake here. Number 97, Why Loro by Junior H. Oh, 
You know, there was so much discourse about another song potentially breaking through this week, uh, that Ecstasy by Suicidal Idol, and it being one of the worst many have heard in recent memory. And instead, we got a solo Junior H regional Mexican track of which I've seen zero discourse altogether. And when you hear this, it makes perfect sense. Junior H is not exactly a dynamic presence. The jittery acoustics have no body around the farty horns and faint skitter of percussion. The production all sounds undercooked. And when translated, the lyrics are a lot of post-breakup misery, albeit with a little bit less pettiness than you might expect. If anything, it's just kind of a wallow where Junior H is trying to desperately escape how bad he feels, but it's coming to the realization that he just can't. And that might actually be kind of sad if I thought the execution of this song could sell that melancholy whatsoever. As it is, it's more forgettable than bad, far from the best or worst in the subgenre. Just not much else to it. Number 76, She Calls Me Back by Noah Kahn and Casey Musgraves. I was not baptized. Everything's alright when she calls me back. She calls me back. Alright, I've been hyping up this remix for the past couple of weeks. Arguably one of the best songs on the original sixth season, augmented by Casey Musgrave stepping in to potentially temper one of Noah Khan's whinging sessions. Cause let's be real, even if I do like the predominantly acoustic groove here and the patter of the original song and the lyrics, this is a pushy song to go off on why this girl just isn't calling him back and accusing her of having some sense of stubborn pride when she's going out and chasing her own dreams, even as he tries to save her. Now the benefit of bringing in Casey Musgraves is that she can push back on all that projection, and the frustrated exhaustion that she can sell to temper all the mood is a huge benefit, especially as she's still calling this guy once a week to soothe his feelings, apparently that's not enough. It reminds me a lot of somebody that I used to know by Gauthier and Kimbra, but unfortunately I'm left thinking that Noah Khan is left off the hook a little bit more here, especially given all the acoustic swell on that chorus. So while I will say it's a very big improvement on the original. Again, songs like this can test my patience, and I think Noah Khan is pushing it, even if I think it's really damn good, if not great. All I'm saying. Number 49, Wild Ones by Jesse Murph and Jelly Roll. It's interesting just how much it feels like certain folks have turned on Jesse Murph as a pop country act. I don't think the organic groundswell is really there, but she sure as hell is getting the collabs and folks outside of her core fandom who either don't like her or aggressively don't care about her. Now granted, when the songs keep being this bad, uh, I get why. With its lead-in scratchy trap beat with the fake snaps and the clunky attempt at country twang, and a vocal mix that seems to be trying to make this sound way edgier than it actually is. And while Jesse Murph is doing her whole disaffected BB Rexa impression, that's bad enough. Who the hell told Jelly Roll that bringing back his rapping was a good idea for this verse? And then there's all the posturing that they're into all sorts of wild, dangerous vibes like smoking and drinking hard liquor and even holding a gun and then referencing Harley Quinn and Gotham City where Jelly Roll saying the police will never take them alive. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just hysterical how much I do not buy this. What it reminds me most of is Bad Things by Camila Cabello and Machine Gun Kelly where the collab has no real chemistry, doesn't make a lot of sense, and yet it thinks it's got way more swagger and bite than it does. But at least Bad Things had the fastball sample to make it somewhat interesting. This just actively sucks. Next. Number 20, Bahamas Promises by Drake. It's sad that I know how to tease. Broken pinky promises. You fucked up our Bahamas trip. I know that you're not for me. Okay, a lot of Drake songs to get through here. I've already reviewed the album. I'm going to try to keep this short for each track, if only for my own sanity. And we're going to start off with a glorified interlude that actually did have some promise with its gentle R&B warbles and the richer backing vocals from Jeronel, until you recognize that the content is Drake crooning about how his shot with this girl named Haley, who is reportedly a young model that worked on one of his album merch rollouts, I think it was for Certified Lover Boy. And well, how all that blew up in his face, because she apparently screwed up a trip to the Bahamas for him and broke some promises so now he's in full concern trolling mode where even if he says he's got too much respect for himself oh you know that's bullshit because otherwise this track would not be here next number 18 what would Pluto do by Drake working on a 
not finished Last time I saw her, she was fucking with my nigga So the question is, the question is What would Pluto do he for the hoe? So I did it What would Pluto do he for the hoe? So I did it What would Pluto do? He definitely fucking on his hoe, Hey. Listen, Drake, if you're taking romantic advice from Future It's probably a bad idea Especially if it results in you dosing this girl's drink with Cialis And then fucking her without a condom Because apparently Adonis needs a sister If only that was the only thing about this song that I doesn't work I actually kind of like that muted piano line but then Drake's doing his swamped out half croon with a clunky auto tune where the Lil Yachty influence is both unmistakable and unwelcome and then Drake goes off on his flexing bullshit where he spends most of his final verse recognizing that this girl did not get a breast reduction to then get inside and bend a dick like the Pope and that's not the only painfully corny line at the end of that verse why do I think an actual future collab could have saved this song? Oh my god. Pray for the remix? Number 17, 8 a.m. in Charlotte by Drake. Top from a bitch that work at corporate sales. Chinchilla, you shanko, we skiing out at Courchevel. Breaking news, they try to kill him, but the boy prevails. All right, here's a Drake song I actually like on this album that unfortunately got mired in controversy thanks to the Conductor Williams credit and the Chipmunk Soul sample. A lot of folks were assuming that Drake was biting Griselda style. I got mixed opinions on that. I mean, Griselda did not originate that sound, especially in the underground. Drake has always done his extended timestamp songs over vibes that are very similar to this. And I'm not about to complain about Drake actually rapping a lot more. And it turns out this is one of the better songs on the album. I'll say it again. Now, it is not exceptional. I don't want to overstate this. Drake running through money and flexes and a lot of veiled threats at his ops. It's routine at this point. But the wordplay feels a little bit sharper. And I do like him trying to give some advice to those who are up and coming in his way to cover their own taxes. And how he actually holds some information against his enemies. I mean, it's implied to be push a T, but I'll believe that when he actually fires a real shot. So yeah, most of this is kind of petty, but it actually feels more grounded. And if I think more of the album was like this it'd have a better reputation decent song number 16 7969 santa by drake i just want to get you off of my mind i just want to get you off of my mind hey yeah damn why does this also feel like a fragment or an interlude? Is the painfully on the nose Snoop Dogg cameo, the Tizo touchdown part, or the Chief Keef sample, or the brittle windswept production that feels like it's set to ramp into a more impressive hook? But then Drake sounds half asleep as he complains about some girl, but not without the line, got you out here moving waist like a belt. Overall, it just feels tossed off, not particularly interesting. If not for the perfunctory shout outs and Snoop Dogg, I'd call it filler. Number 15, Amen by Drake featuring Tizo Touchdown. Pray again, pray again. Thank you, Father. Pray again. Pray until you find Amen. Speaking of Tizo. Okay, I know I'm not the only one who's not hearing the hype with this guy. I know he's getting the big industry push the past few years. I know his album from earlier this year got some pretty divisive reviews, but this is probably his biggest cosign and hell, he's got more space to deliver all the gospel flourishes against those twinkling staccato piano chords and the soul sample and the leaden bass than Drake does for his verse. But honestly, it's not a bad verse, as it does connect through all the things that he's buying this girl to hopefully ensure some vestige of loyalty that he probably won't reciprocate. But there's also this sour, condescending edge to framing this track as praying for this girl finding a man who can treat her as well as he does even if he's probably going to cheat on her. It's also awkwardly sequenced. It's the second song on the album, and it does nothing for any sense of broader momentum. But outside of Tizo Touchdown being generally fine, this isn't special. I'll say it. Number 12, Gently by Drake featuring Bad Bunny. I think this was the song that turned off a lot of rap fans expecting more, well, rap on this album. I don't get why, as Drake and Bad Bunny have worked together going back to at least 2018. Maybe folks just didn't like the obvious play for commercial crossover. And Drake's cringeworthy Spanish is about as bad as 
well, mine is. But once you get past Drake, the bassy reggaeton groove actually has more texture and punch than I expected. And it gets better when Bad Bunny comes in for something closer to Latin Trap for his very horny brand of debauchery. It's probably lacking more melody to really stick for me in my taste, and I'm not going to call this all that special, especially in reggaeton. It's, it is a commercial cash, and let's be real, but I also don't think it's bad, all things considered. And hell, if you want the real cash in, number 11, Rich Baby Daddy by Drake featuring Sexy Red and SZA. Hands all you need, hands all you need, hands all you need, shake that ass for Drake, now shake that ass for me. I remember seeing so many people getting so mad about this song and Drake working with Sexy Red for the cheapest strip club pop I've heard in a while with that bounce groove. But again, I'm not surprised that Drake is doing this. He's done it for years in various capacities. And for what it's worth, it's not a precisely bad crossover either. I don't hate this. I don't think Sexy Red needed a verse, but her hook is more on point than I expected. The washed out melody bounces out the quicker percussion pretty well, even if the vocals all feel really compressed on this song. It's one of the few tracks on this album with actual momentum, I'll give him that. And while Drake can sell a lot of his day's strip club musings, SZA once again steals the show. She sounds great opposite this production. But the big problem is one that's endemic across this album and we're going to get to more later. And that before the song properly ends, Drake tacks on this outro where he seems to come to his senses and realizes he probably should not have made all those promises in the strip club, but also interpolates Dog Days Are Over by Florence and the Machine rather badly. Now, I don't mind the idea of what Drake is trying here and that he's trying to be regretful of all this, but it also pushes the track over five minutes and it feels like this fragment was stapled on in post. The execution's just really haphazard. So, no, I don't hate this nearly as much as seemingly everyone else does. I just can't say it works exactly well either. All I'm saying. Number 10, Fear of Heights by Drake. Okay, dude, you gotta stop concern trolling Rihanna. It's gone so far beyond creepy at this point. I mean, the watery synths might try to set off a conspiratorial vibe and leave it quasi-ambiguous, but then we get the grinding rage beat with the wispy trap snares as Drake goes off on more generic flexing, and now he totally does not pay for sex. He's just tipping for the service. Sure, dude. And I get how Drake is trying to accentuate how scary all this is, as if his bad Playboy Cardi impression doesn't already spook you. But truth be told, I'm not scared. Not by any of this. There should be something tangibly unknown that might drive some fear, and all this is just way too goddamn familiar. So yeah, next. Number eight, Daylight by Drake. Shot him in daylight. Shot him in daylight. Shot him in daylight. Okay, let's put aside the painfully obvious Tony Montana snippet from Scarface to open up the track. I know Drake's playing the villain. The grimy trap beat from Southside, it's obviously setting it up. But I will say it, it's a bit more effective in selling the atmosphere. And while Drake is still on his very bad Playboy Cardi imitation, the wordplay is a little punchier across the threats on the second verse. Even if I'm not about to engage with how this may potentially be addressing some XXXTentacion rumors around his death. But again, Drake just does not have the intensity or tangible menace to sell this well. And I'm left thinking that more folks are probably here for Adonis's clumsy but kind of endearing outro than anything Drake is actually saying here. And you know, while we're in that territory, number five, Calling For You by Drake featuring 21 Savage. I don't see a savage. She wanna be the one. She know I come a steady. She wanna hold a gun. If you want it, you can have it. Let's be real, the only reason that this is charting this high is because the folks who liked her loss are praying that it's a leftover. And it is, in many of the worst ways possible. The one thing I'll somewhat endorse is the blocky Jersey Club rumble off the initial groove, even if it shows Drake chasing trends. But then he starts using that time to start creeping on girls in their early 20s, of which he's overly curious. But you know what, if we're judging that by the god-awful extended interlude, he's probably gonna treat these girls as if they're not on his level when he buys them things. I mean, 
obviously you're not as classy as you think you are here either drake but then it switches into a chipmunk soul flip with a deliberate her loss callback and 21 savage has his verse and i'm sorry this is a throwaway it's very obviously stitched together in post yeah it might be better mastered than the majority of her loss was but it's still bad unlike number three virginia beach by drake Fantasizing, that's not love you're in is more like compromising. All right, here's where I give him some credits. This song is legit really damn good. And not just for the watery guitars that ramp into that ominous warp sample of Frank Ocean backing up the trap percussion, I actually really like Drake singing on the hook and how the frustration of the toxic give and take of this relationship manifests. Granted, this also has its fair share of corny lines. When he's threatening this girl's new guy, we've got the line, he gonna find out it's on site like WWW. And the exasperation at this girl's apparent selfishness needs to be taken with several grains of salt especially coming from drake that being said if there's a song where i can actually buy a little bit more dimension almost sink into the atmosphere it is this one it's a really strong opener that the rest of the album cannot remotely pay off one example of that number two i don't give a fuck by drake featuring yeet I i'll be giving a fuck i say whatever i want i do whatever i want I kind of money, money for fun. fun. You know, popping me purging for fun. You know, I'm fucking tired of beating around the bush. Pardon the pun. This song is dog shit, and all the more evidence that Drake attempting to chase the rage anthems for the kids is a really bad idea, especially if he's getting Yeet, who have, I've only found to be mediocre at best. Frankly, I'm being generous. Yes, I think the synths and Azimuth's vocals to open up the song, they had some potential, especially with that trumpet, and then it slams into chiptune slop, with entirely too many hideous vocal layers, especially around the hook, that feature all sorts of ugly squawking that sounds atrocious. It, this is doesn't even go hard. I grew up in the era of crunk that it at least throws some muscle behind the bad mixing. And here, there's no grit, there's no swagger to this, as Drake tries to sell the I stay in the O with lines that would have had Big Sean laughed out of the room a decade ago. And then there's Yeet, who has never once had anything interesting to say in all his flexing, and is trying his own god-awful Playboy Cardi impression where he can't even stay on beat. And again, all this flexing is at the expense of the audience, at you. And when it's so obviously this boring garbage, the enablement is what I find so gross. Fans friggin' demand better. So yeah, all this fucking sucks. And Drake giving Yeet a cosign to push past his overextended 15th minute. Fuck all of this. And finally, number one, First Person Shooter by Drake featuring J. Cole. Big as the Super Bowl, but the difference is it's just two guys playing shit that they did in the studio. Niggas usually send their verses back to me and they be terrible just like a two-year-old. Yeah, this should be way better than it is. And if it wasn't for Drake's insecurity, it probably would have been much better. Let's not mince words. For J. Cole's first number one, he utterly washes Drake on his own song, where Drake decided to go for what sounds like a bad Kanye West impression, talking about getting bad verses from other stars and who the GOAT could possibly be. And then J. Cole goes off on his verse, including a really nice flow switch, where the braggadociousness is not super layered or special, but it is effective. And then with no warning or transition, the beat switches awkwardly for another rap verse from Drake, where I actually kind of dig the darker melody, but the bass mixing's a lot rougher, and we get lines about how he packs women's names into his phone like sardines, complains more about being disrespected, and how he's so close to beating Michael Jackson's record for number one hits. Let's put aside how Drake should not give a shit about the fucking Hot 100, especially when he clearly doesn't care about the Grammys, Billboard is not some greater august institution than the Academy, but on a track where you want to accentuate that you are the best in the game right now why even give your time to all this petty punching down especially when j cole he still washes you on the song to the point where i just know that last verse was added in post because you didn't want j cole to have the last word on what's gonna become a number one hit this is not you being in your villain arc drake it's so revealingly insecure how you're only doing this because nobody's buying it on the merit of the art and yeah even with all that Sure, it's a good song, but it's not great. And let's keep it 100. Nobody on this track really is great.
Let's be real. That concludes our week. God, it's exhausting. Worst is I don't give a fuck by Drake and Yeet, but Drake is not getting the dishonorable mention. That's for Wild Ones by Jesse Murph and Jelly Roll. What an utterly abysmal song. Now, best of the week... You know what? Virginia Beach by Drake was really damn close, but that's getting the honorable mention. Because She Calls Me Back by Noah Kahn and Casey Musgraves, they kind of have that top spot. Yeah, the song's got problems, but it's the best hook here. I'll say that. Next week, I can't even say it's going to be Fallout, because Bad Bunny's right around the corner. Stay tuned for that, I guess. But until then, I'm Mark. You're watching Billboard Breakdown, affiliated with Spectrum Pulse. I'll see you next time.